Welcome to NTD News, I'm Paul Graney. Here are today's top stories. Nine members of a community of Mormons with dual U.S.-Mexico citizenship were killed in Mexico while driving to see relatives. The victims include babies, young children, and three women. The House releases transcripts from diplomats who testified behind closed doors for the Democrat-led impeachment inquiry. They've also requested that another White House official testify. U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper speaks out against China's sale of highly autonomous drones. The lethal drones are being sold to the Middle East and are capable of targeted strikes. A new study shows deaths from heart failure are on the rise in the U.S. A heart expert tells you how to maintain your heart health. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average hit a record high today. This based on expectations of the U.S. closing a trade deal with China. Nine members of a Mormon community with dual U.S.-Mexican citizenship were killed when crossing between two Mexican states today. Those killed include three women, four young children, and two babies. Authorities believe Mexican criminal groups are to blame and that the deaths were probably a result of mistaken identity. At least five children were able to escape and walk home. One of them was wounded. Another child was reported missing after escaping into the woods. The three cars of people that endured the attack were going to visit relatives. A video showing a burned-out car full of ash and bullet holes is believed to be one of the cars that endured the attack. The attack caught the attention of U.S. politicians. There are parts of Mexico that I'd rather go to Syria than Mexico. Uh, there are some places over there that are just completely lawless. And it's uh, moms and children. This is really unthinkable. And, uh, you know, I agree with the president when he says Mexico has to really uh, knuckle down and go after some of these cartels. And, and president Trump addressed the issue on Twitter, lamenting the loss of life and offering to help Mexico clean out its drug cartels. Trump wrote that he is awaiting a call from the Mexican president. I'll speak with President Trump to thank him for his support and to see if in cooperation agreements there's the possibility of getting help in cases where it is necessary and under the framework of the prevailing international legality of bilateral agreements. The two presidents ultimately did speak. They discussed the tragedy along with efforts to combat growing violence in the region. Trump offered Mexico assistance to ensure the perpetrators face justice. They also discussed ongoing border cooperation and strong bilateral ties between the two countries. Several U.S. security agencies are trying to reassure Americans that the U.S. is taking care of election security. While elections are handled by state and local governments, the federal agencies said in a statement that they are supporting them as much as possible. This comes after accusations by Democrats that the federal government is not doing enough to secure U.S. elections. The agencies warned that countries like Iran, China, and Russia are trying to interfere in the United States' democracy, including via cyber attacks and disinformation campaigns. Officials recommended only using trusted sources and in election information, like state and local election officials. They are asking the public to report any suspicious election activity to the FBI or the Department of Homeland Security. New developments in the impeachment inquiry today. Several House committees released transcripts from two, di two diplomats who testified behind closed doors last month. And another White House official has been asked, so far without a subpoena, to testify before the three committees leading the investigation. Three committees released the transcripts of Gordon Sunland, the U.S. ambassador to the European Union, and Kurt Volker, the former U.S. representative for Ukraine negotiations. In Sunland's testimony, he denied there was any quid pro quo related to aid to Ukraine. Volker, who resigned in September, said he was never given a reason for the U.S. aid to be withheld. The aid was withheld before the July 25th phone call between President Trump and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. House Democrats are looking into whether Trump ordered the aid to be withheld to pressure Ukraine to investigate potential corruption by Joe Biden and his son. Volker said he never told the Ukrainians the aid was suspended. He was confident it would be restored, and it was. As for claims Trump asked for an investigation into the Bidens in exchange for a meeting with Ukraine's president, Sunland said that wasn't the case. Volker also said Trump never asked Ukraine to investigate the Bidens in exchange for meeting Zelensky. He said Trump did resist the meeting because he had a negative view of Ukrainian officials based on long-standing corruption in the country. 
Sunland said the only condition the White House made before the meeting was that Ukraine make a public embrace of anti-corruption reforms. He said such Western reforms are consistent with U.S. support for rule of law in Ukraine going back decades under both Republican and Democrat administrations. Sunland said he did speak to President Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, but never about Biden. In his phone conversations, Giuliani did mention Burisma Holdings, he said. Burisma is the Ukrainian gas company Joe Biden's son sat on the board of. But Sunland said he never knew of the connection to the Bidens until he read about it in the press. The White House responded to the transcript saying they show there is even less evidence for this illegitimate impeachment sham than previously thought. Also related to the impeachment investigation, White House Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney was asked to testify on Friday. U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper spoke out against China's sale of highly autonomous drones on the international market. He's also raising concerns about the Chinese military's artificial intelligence ambitions. As we speak, the Chinese government is already exporting some of the most advanced military aerial drones to the Middle East as it prepares to export its next generation stealth UAVs when those come online. Esper made the comments during a conference organized by the National Security Commission of Artificial uh, Intelligence. In addition, Chinese weapons manufacturers are selling drones advertised as capable of full autonomy, including the ability to conduct lethal targeted strikes. This is the first time a top U.S. official has spoken publicly about China's sale of lethal autonomous drones, even though it is suspected that the machines have been sold to countries in the Middle East since at least late 2018. Esper emphasized China's use of AI as a tool to impose authoritarian rule over its population, especially Muslim Uyghurs. All signs point to the construction of a 21st century surveillance state designed to censor speech and deny basic human rights on an unprecedented scale. Esper urges the AI community to stop enabling Chinese firms' unethical use of the technology. FBI Director Christopher Wray and Acting DHS Secretary Kevin McElhaney testifying today in the Senate Homeland Security Committee. On the agenda, domestic security threats, including virtual threats, domestic terrorism, and U.S. gang activity. The Department of Homeland Security Undersecretary David Glau explained that cyber criminals are increasing the frequency and sophistication of their attacks. China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are developing and using advanced cyber capabilities and attempt to target critical infrastructure, steal our national security and trade secrets, and threaten our democratic institutions. FBI Director Christopher Wray added that intellectual property and data theft is affecting companies and academic institutions of almost every size and sector. And that's involving nearly all of the FBI's 56 field offices, and I can tell you that number is representing a significant uptick from a few years ago, and it's growing. Described as one of the most pervasive homeland threats, domestic terrorism and its connection to social media were also discussed at large. These extremists are often motivated by violent ideologies or perceived grievances, often targeting race, ethnicity, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, gender, or gender identity. ...involve racially motivated, violent extremist motivated terrorist attacks, and the majority of those, of the racially motivated violent extremist attacks, uh, are fueled by some kind of white supremacy. And I would say that the most lethal activity over the last few years has been committed by those type of attackers. Ray added that the majority of racially motivated attacks are fueled by white supremacy. When asked what steps the FBI is taking to contain MS-13 and inner city gangs, Ray explained that neighborhood gang activity has been leading the trend. He didn't offer many details on the growth of the threat, but said crime rates have decreased in the last year or two. And records broken the stock market this week. The Dow Jones and other indexes have reached unprecedented levels as the market's rally carries into a fifth week. Entity's Miguel Moreno has more. Expectations of a U.S.-China trade deal sent the three main U.S. stock indices soaring. President Trump announced the news Monday. So today, we just hit the highest number in the history of the stock market, and that's hundreds of... These climbs are the result of a nearing phase one U.S.-China trade deal, which may be signed by the end of this month. U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross reinforced his hope on Tuesday, saying very good progress was being made. 
The expectation of a trade deal has also driven up the value of the U.S. dollar and crude oil prices, and according to reports last week, the job market is continuing to grow. Manufacturing has been hit hard by the trade conflict, but investors have hope that things may be hitting bottom soon. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, New York. Up next, a volunteer medic in Hong Kong gets injured after police throw tear gas at medics and journalists. Witnesses say police also delayed an ambulance coming to help the injured medic. More on that when we return. This season, take an incredible journey through 5,000 years of culture with Shen Yun. Discover why people are calling Shen Yun a visual feast. A pleasure to the ear. An epic tale. A must see. Shen Yun, an all new production every year. The lasting beauty of traditional oil painting, realistic style, Brilliant, moving, expressive. 2019 NTD Television International Competition for Figure Painting in Oil. Guided by truthfulness, kindness, and beauty. We invite you to join us on our journey back to traditional art. Gold Prize Award of $10,000. For more detail, please visit oilpainting.ntdtv.com. Viewers have described China Uncensored like The Daily Show, but about China. Well, at the beginning, I was super excited when I got 500 views, and now the show's grown to about half a million subscribers on YouTube. One episode reached 7.9 million people. I'm a little freaked out that that many people have seen my face. In five years, I see China Uncensored as the sole source of edutainment worldwide. And in Hong Kong, a volunteer medic at a protest has been severely burned by a tear gas grenade that police threw into the midst of journalists, medics and civilians. And today's Jeremy Sandberg reports from Hong Kong. The injured medic, a university student. His friends and colleagues at the school spoke out today, condemning police brutality and calling for support from the school. The situation in Hong Kong is becoming ridiculous that the police is attacking everyone. Randomly. The student first aider was attending a protest when police threw the grenade into the midst of journalists and first aiders, even though there was no threat or protesters. The Chinese made tear gas canisters are known to burn at an extremely high heat when detonating. Sparks were said to be seen on the first aider's back when he was hit. He was not wearing a mask and inhaled large amounts of gas. Always, uh, you can see from the camera and the video clips, and that the Hong Kong police lost their temper and shout at the citizens, and also using the uh, pepper spray to, uh, to attack the journalists or even the uh, pedestrians. So the Shuyan University Student Union is urging the university to take a stand against injustice, provide assistance to the injured student take action to protect students from random searches on campus, and publicly condemn the violent tactics and weapons used by the police force. I knew about communism when I was a boy. I came from to Hong Kong uh, because I wanted to escape from it. But then now we, we are facing it right here, up front. Witnesses say the police stopped an ambulance from entering the scene, delaying medical attention to the injured medic. Unimaginable that Hong Kong has turned to such a state of affairs. It's almost like overnight that there is a different, totally different Hong Kong. Uh, of course, the most obvious would be the behavior of our police. Students expressed gratitude to the firemen and those on the scene who provided medical attention, as well as to the civilian who defended the victim against further harm. Students are outraged with the behavior and level of violence from the police and are calling for accountability and an independent investigation into police conduct. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News, Hong Kong. For months, one weekend after another, Hong Kong protesters have clashed with police, suffering the effects of tear gas and other injuries from authorities. 
Behind the scenes are medical practitioners helping the countless injured protesters. A group of traditional Chinese medicine practitioners are offering various services for aid volunteers and protesters alike. Those who do not want to visit a hospital or clinic for fear of having their identities revealed. The most popular treatment sought after is acupuncture to help with relieving muscles and sores. Sometimes you go to clinics, you see a doctor, but maybe the doctor will send your reports to police and say these people get inflection from tear gas so maybe these people go to protex so it's quite horrible other volunteers chip in by packing herbs powder into small bags for easy distribution at rally sites each week at that time i start to think about if they are afraid to go to hospital they're afraid to go to clinic why don't we take one more step i give them some herbs powder that packed up already. The herbs powder treats symptoms caused by tear gas, such as a cough, diarrhea, and other respiratory problems. It helps alleviate the reactions and stamp out further serious health impacts. Over 10,000 packets of herb powder has been distributed since the end of August, and the demand for such products looks set to continue. Chinese leader Xi Jinping met Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam in a surprise meeting on Monday in Shanghai. Xi reiterated trust in Lam, along with support for measures taken by her government to end the crisis. Xi's comments follow shortly after Chinese Communist Party or CCP elite signaled a tougher stance on Hong Kong last week. Up next, a new study shows deaths from heart failure are on the rise in the U.S. A heart expert tells you how to maintain your heart health. More on that after the break. Deaths from heart failure, one of the nation's leading killers, is on the rise. And today's Penny Joe has more on the data, plus, plus tips from experts on early prevention. A recent study published in the JAMA Cardiology Journal showed that in the U.S., lives taken by heart failure surged by 38 percent from 2011 to 2017. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, around 5.7 million Americans suffer from heart failure. That's about double the population of Chicago. Experts say that obesity and diabetes are partially to blame for the increase, as well as a rapidly aging population who are more vulnerable to heart failure. We've been aware of this problem for a long time but I don't think we've seen improvements in the way we're hoping to. And Dr. Shalin Ra is a heart failure cardiology at NYU Langone. She encourages everyone to look at the contents on the packaging when doing their grocery shopping. For example, too much salt intake can be bad for the heart. Dr. Ra suggested 2,000 milligrams of sodium per day for an average adult. That can be found in one teaspoon of salt. But on average, Americans eat about 3,400 milligrams of sodium per day. It's unlikely that someone ate three bags of potato chips and got a big salt load and gave themselves immediate heart failure. But it's really over time, it causes weight gain, it causes high blood pressure, um, it can affect how the heart and kidney interact, and then leads down the path to heart failure or worsening of heart symptoms. Apart from potato chips, Dr. Ross said cured meats, cheese, canned food, and soup all tend to have unexpectedly high amounts of salt. 
and for people who eat out a lot. I often tell my patients to speak up, say that they're looking for lower salt or more、uh, dish with vegetables. Exercise can also help. You know, trying to get 30 minutes, about three, four times a week of aerobic exercise is very helpful for just maintaining your, you know, glucose metabolism, keeping your muscles healthy, giving your heart that extra conditioning. So it counterbalances. Mostly, who with a poor diet and little to no exercise are pushed to it by a busy lifestyle. Dr. Rao says, apart from more community programs to educate people, it's on us, the individuals, to make a conscious effort to improve our health. Penny Zhou, NTD News. Telecoms giant AT&T has agreed to pay $60 million in a settlement with the Federal Trade Commission over allegations that it misled millions of people over unlimited data plans. The settlement stems from an investigation the FTC launched in 2014. It accused AT&T of failing to warn customers that it would reduce data speeds if they went over a certain threshold in the billing cycle. The FTC claims that AT&T started this bait and switch scam back in 2011 and has victimized 3.5 million customers. According to the statement, the $60 million settlement will be used to partially refund current and former AT&T customers. No further action is required by the customers. One of California's largest law enforcement training associations is recognizing the work of one man in the fight against drug abuse. California Narcotic Officers Association last month awarded Frank Lee the San Francisco Bay Area and California Citizen of the Year awards. Lee is the president of the Organization for Justice and Equality and Bay Area director of the California Coalition Against Drugs. He is recognized for his efforts to fight against drug abuse, especially marijuana. It's very encouraging. It really reflects that our hard work. Uh, is uh, recognized. Lee says he and his organizations work closely with the California Narcotic Officers Association. The two major ones include defeating a bill which, if approved, would allow illegal drug injection centers to be operated in San Francisco, paving the way for eventual legalization of all drugs in the nation. He is referring to Assembly Bill 362, which aimed to create safe injection sites in San Francisco. But those opposed say it would increase drug use. The second major success relates to a bill called SB 625 that was blocked. It would have allowed smoking pot on public transportation. Assembly Bill 1810 declared that illegal. If we allow, you know, smoking of pot on public、uh, transportation. Vehicles, then step by step, they would go in all public places,、uh, rendering、uh, California uninhabitable. He and his organizations are concerned about the Secure and Fair Enforcement Banking Act, also known as the Safe Banking Act of 2019. If approved, would allow marijuana companies to use banks as if they were、uh, legalized companies. So this is very serious. This will expedite the growth of marijuana industry, and also it would pave the way for eventual legalization of marijuana in the whole nation. This bill is making progress at the federal level. Lee urges citizens to call or write to their senators with their concerns. For those who want to fight against marijuana, Lee encourages people to cooperate with city officials, leaders, and police to maintain their quality of life. Eileen Ng, NTD News, Santa Clara, California. Up next, a virtual reality experience takes people back in time to the Berlin Wall, giving a new generation of Germans a taste of the experience the older generation had at a defining period in history. More on that after the break. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and bited-out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep-dive format, where we can explore their ideas together. And so, American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled, and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. 
sure to check out our new episodes every week. This week, a new YouTube show and virtual reality experience transports people to the streets of Berlin. It's time to coincide with the 30th anniversary of the toppling of the, Ver of the Berlin Wall. Viewers stand alongside three young people in a residential street and see the initial coils of barbed wire that overnight closed off Soviet-occupied East Berlin from West Berlin. I think it's really important that the young people, that we get young people to engage in this story because there's a bigger story around the Berlin Wall. And I think she was 17, but I'm not entirely sure when they made a last-minute decision to flee while the wall was being built. The wall was built to stop East Germans fleeing to the West. It began as a barbed wire wall, but then became a heavily fortified 100-mile white concrete barrier that encircled West Berlin. One student got to see the tunnel his grandfather built to help East Germans flee into the West. When we finished the filming, he got straight on the phone to his grandfather and he was like, I've been in your tunnel. And, you know, it was a really, really powerful reaction. The show uses a combination of real historic photographs and graphics to create a 3D world to take people back in time. I think that, like, the biggest thing you can take from the story overall is that, like, the, all the students that did that, including my grandfather, were like really selfless about doing that. YouTube's Virtually History launches on November 6th to mark the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And at a Colombian zoo, officials saying a baby tapir is doing well after a rocky start. Almost a month ago, the Los Alcaraz Zoo welcomed a baby tapir named Celeste. But shortly after birth, Celeste's mother rejected her. According to zoo employees who took over her care, she is now in excellent condition. She didn't get milk from her mother, so we supplied it artificially with one that is used for horses. While Celeste is now doing well, zoo employees say because she wasn't raised in the wild, it's best for her to remain at the zoo. So having the animals raised in artificial conditions and under people's care, it is difficult for them to return to their habitat. Since all tapir species are endangered or vulnerable, Celeste's birth is good news for the survival of the species. And that's all for today's NTD News. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Paul Graney.